thank you for joining us at the Caring.com Digital Marketing Academy webinar on SEO, Three Misconceptions You Should Know About. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First of all, slides from this webinar will be sent out to you within three business days. Um, we're also uh, live tweeting at, at Caring Insights, if you'd like to follow us there. And um, we hope that we'll be able to share a recording with you as well. Last time it didn't work, um, but hopefully this time it will. So watch your email for the deck from today's presentation. Also, this is a one-way webinar. However, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the control panel on your screen and submitting them. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end, and my colleague Megan Fletcher, who's here with us, will be moderating the questions for me. Also, um, this is your two-minute sales pitch on caring.com. Um, as many of you know, we are the leading website specifically for caregivers, family caregivers of elderly loved ones. Um, we get about 3 million people every month visiting our website. Those are unique visitors. Um, we've gotten 90,000 consumer reviews of all different services, housing, uh, in-home care, geriatric care managers, senior move managers, a number of others. We have 70,000 local listings, thousands of original articles, very active support groups where family caregivers can interact with each other. And we are part of Bankrate's powerful network of uh, a number of financial services um, and other helpful websites for consumers, totaling about 14 million monthly visitors. With that, um, I am thrilled to be able to turn things over to AJ Cohn. AJ blogs about SEO uh, at his site, um, Blind Five Year Old. He has been a friend of Caring.com for many, many years, um, has helped us significantly get to those 3 million monthly visitors. And I'm very pleased to be able to. Uh, to have him share his insights with you. So with that, um, bear with us here for a minute. I'm going to turn the presentation over to AJ, and he will introduce himself and talk to you about three misconceptions of SEO. OK, AJ, you're on. All right. Get things going here. Well, thank you, Katie, and hello to everyone out there. Today, I'm going to talk about some SEO myths, in particular, three popular misconceptions that have uh, either taken root or are going around recently. But first, a little bit of who I am and, and why you should listen to me. So, my name is AJ Cohn. I do run a consultancy called Blind Five-Year-Old. I have spoken at conferences such as MozCon and SMX and have been featured on sites ranging from Search Engine Land to TechCrunch to The Street. I'm originally from Pennsylvania and I attended George Washington University, not with that guy, but uh, studied marketing and graduated from there and then went into advertising which was not nearly as glamorous as it is made out to be on Mad Men. After that, I was a fundraiser, uh, and I did fundraising for universities, raising money for the annual fund for a number of universities, and that's where I basically honed my skills in direct marketing, uh, both telemarketing and direct mail. But it was clear to me that I would need to move to the Internet to continue to grow, and so early on I did that, and I... I rode the roller coaster of the dot-com era, uh, both up and down. Here's, here's me, unemployed, being featured in the Walnut Wall Street Journal. Uh, but then I got back in, uh, and I got back in and I started doing paid search. 
uh, and in particular at Alibris, if you're familiar with used, rare, and out-of-print books. And I worked there and got 25% growth for three consecutive years, doing most of it through paid search, which I still think is a great thing. But the Google tax went up, and it became more and more expensive to buy that traffic, essentially. And I got interested, and I thought, well, why buy the cow when you can get it for free? And that's how I got into SEO and how to get free traffic to your site and to be featured on those search engines. Now, first, people talk about SEO a lot, and I think many people have the wrong idea about what SEO is. And a lot of people think SEO is, you know, snake oil, uh, or it's just spam. And who can blame you when, you know, if you have a blog, you're going to get these really fabulous comments coming into your blog about uh, how great your blog is and uh, to do all these things, and it's, it's awful. But this is an SEO. Um, and there's this idea that, you know, an SEO is back there like Monty Burns, uh, trying to sort of figure out how to dominate and do all these nefarious things, but that's not SEO. And so I have a different definition of SEO. It's very user-centric, uh, and mine is that search engine optimization seeks to generate productive organic traffic via technically sound and connected sites by matching query syntax and intent with relevance and value. Now, that's a mouthful. I get it. Uh, and I actually have an entire deck on what SEO really is. But I urge you, uh, you can check out the bit.ly link here. Hopefully it's easy to get to. And you can read the post, which really encapsulates everything. I'm going to go over some of the, the small parts of this or the more important parts of it because it relates to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about later. So first is something called user syntax, which is really a fancy you know, word for saying, what are the words that people use to search and find you? And I often find that the words that, that the people inside an organization use are not the words that users use. Now, this is obviously a sort of a crazy example, but here, you know, maybe it's an all-weather fluid displacement sculpture. Maybe that's how the people who make this think about it. But when people are searching for it, they're searching for outdoor water fountains. Uh, and so it's always thinking about what words, how are they searching for these things. The other thing is why are they really searching? So here's a, a great one. I love using this example. Someone's searching for a Eureka 4870 manual, right? So this is a, an upright vacuum cleaner. Now, if they're searching for this manual, are they searching for that manual? Or what are they really searching for, right? My guess is, is that something's wrong with this vacuum, right? Something is broken. Uh, and so when I build a page maybe for this term, I'm not going to just have the manual, though hopefully I do, because that's the primary intent of what they want. But they probably want maybe ideas on how to fix things. Maybe they want vacuum repair close by. Maybe they want replacement parts. Maybe they want, you know, cleaning services. Uh, whatever that might be, there are a whole host of things that I can put on that page to satisfy that intent. And so at the end of the day, I talk to people about you might target a keyword, but you have to optimize for the intent behind that keyword. If you really want to think about intent, it's about aggregating intent, and it's about satisfying that active intent, and you really win in search when you satisfy passive intent, which is basically, what are they going to look for next? What's the next question that they're going to ask? If I have that on that page, then I'm going to win. They're going to stay there. Uh, again, I can't go too far into this. There's a great post on this. Again, use the link down there, aggregating intent uh, with Bitly, and you should get there. So let's talk about the first SEO myth that we have. And that is that content is king. Uh, and I'm guessing that many of you have been approached by people, and they said, hey, you know, it's all about content. Start a blog. Just do some content, content marketing. Just get the content out there, and, and everything works, right? Uh, and here's Mr. Stephen King, uh, and he does have some great content, absolutely. But content alone is not going to work. Uh, it just doesn't work that way, right? This is not Hollywood. If you publish content, they will not come magically. If 
It just does not work like that. And what I tell people is the amount of time you spend creating the content needs to be matched by the time you spend promoting it. So if you spend an hour, maybe two hours creating a piece of content, you need to spend an hour or two actually promoting that content and really getting it out there and figuring out how to get it in front of the right people. And this is not an easy task at a, by any stretch of the imagination. And I always tell people this, right? If you're going to do content marketing, it's a big deal. So what do I mean about promoting it? Well, number one, you got to get social, right? You have the social things now in this vertical. It's a little more difficult, uh, obviously, but it's still there. Um, and in fact, you might not be on Tumblr. You might not be on Instagram, but there are other platforms, right? You've got Facebook. You've got Pinterest. You've got Twitter. Um, you've got StumbleUpon. You've got maybe uh, any various numbers of platforms that you can get social on. The second one is to answer questions, right? And this is a really easy one. Um, here's, here we are on Quora, and there's a question what is the most important to you when seeking in-home care for your senior loved ones? If you've got a post on this, uh, you want to answer, right? I'm not saying you go into these things and you just link drop and, and do all that sort of stuff, but if you actually take some time, craft an answer, reference your, your piece of content, this is a great way to get in front of people and to do that. And look at all the related questions here on the right-hand side. Tremendous amount of them. Uh, there's a lot of this stuff out here. You can go to other places. There's Yahoo Answers. The level there is a little less, but uh, certainly there. Also, sometimes if you don't see a question that matches the content that you have, ask it. Ask the question and then answer it. Now, you might want to do those under different uh, names and maybe have a friend ask that question, but you can certainly do that. That's uh, sort of a, a clever little hack that you can do sometimes. AJ, uh, it's Katie. I have to break in here. Karen.com yes. has questions on our site specifically related to elder care that are posted by the visitors. So you can come to our site and answer questions as well. There you go. Another perfect place to do it uh, because you're going to get in front of those three million uh, unique visitors every month uh, or some portion of those. The other way is obviously to join the conversation. Uh, similar to answering questions, but these are other places where conversations about your topic are happening on the web. Uh, so I just did a little bit of, of Googling around. This is a post it's back from 2014. It's on HuffPo, uh, right up your ass. There is not a single comment on this post. Uh, so it's a great place to actually come in and say, hey, I've got something to say about this. I'm going to write uh, an interesting comment, and maybe I'll link to the piece of, of content that supports what I'm talking about. And you get in front of a lot of different people. Uh, this is another way to get your content out there and to get your brand in front of the right people. Now, obviously, sometimes uh, doing all this isn't enough, uh, and sometimes you need to get the ball rolling, right? Uh, it's tough to get this stuff done. And so sometimes paid social is a great way to essentially start things off. So whether or not that is on Twitter or most likely on Facebook where you can sort of promote that post and get it in front of the people so that the normal social sharing potentially can take over and get the ball rolling downhill. So paid social is uh, part of the equation as well. And really what you're trying to do is with every piece of content that you put out, you're trying to get true fans. Uh, and this is a post by Kevin Kelly, uh, if you go to that link there. Uh, and it was really targeted more towards artists and, and, and very small business people. And the concept was you only need a thousand true fans, uh, not likes or followers, but people who are really engaged to survive as a business. And I've extended this essentially in terms of evangelizers for your business. And so when I talk about promoting your content, you know, at the beginning, you're going to have to do all that work if, if you don't have that community, if you don't have that fan base. But over time, hopefully, your content is good enough, you're interacting with the community enough that you get these fans. And when you publish another piece of content, you have to do less of the promoting because your fans are doing the promoting for you. Um, it takes a very long time, though. And so here's actually uh, my own personal blog. These are the stats uh, for my personal blog. I've been blogging since 
well, well, I guess mid-2008, but I'm showing you 2009 to present, essentially. And you can see for about two and a half years, I blogged and pretty much nothing happened. <laughs> you know, it just, it, it's a hard, long slog. And so I tell people, if you're going to think about content marketing, if you're going to think about embracing content, you have to think in terms of years, not months. So if you've got someone who says, you know, let's try this out for three months and see if it works, it's already failed, right? That, that it just won't work that way. Um, you need to basically say, we believe that content is the way that we're going to be able to communicate our values, our mission, our unique selling uh, proposition, and who we are to the community. Uh, if that is what you want to do, then this is great, but it's going to take both great content and great promotion and marketing of that content to get it done. So the next time someone just says, hey, fire up a blog and everything will be fine, that's not how it is. That's a myth. So let's go on to myth number two. And this one's a really interesting one. That's the idea of never link out, right? Which is the idea of, you know, I, uh, page rank, I guess, is, is what most people think about, right? Uh, I, I spent all of this time and energy to accumulate all of this page rank, and when I link out, I'm giving it away. And, and that's a bad thing, right? And I tell people not linking out to other sites is a lot like saving money under your mattress. It really just doesn't do you much good. It's not working for you at that point. And what we really have to talk about are the two ways in which Google looks at sites and, and how traffic goes through them. And so you can either be a bow tie or you can be a pogo stick. Now the bow tie model is one in which someone searches, they come to the site, that's the knot in the middle, and maybe they then from from that site, they go to another place, right? And they don't go back to the search result, right? They don't go back to the search result and say, well, I didn't really find what I was wanting, so I gotta reformulate my query. Or I have another question which wasn't answered there, so I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna type in something else, right? That's actually pogo sticking, right? When someone goes to a site and then says, mm, nope, I didn't get my answer, and they come back to that search result, Maybe they, they select another result from the same search result and they click through on that. That's pogo sticking behavior. You don't want that because uh, that's a very bad signal that Google looks for that says, you know, gee, we, we just we got someone, one of our users, to go to the site, but it clearly wasn't satisfying because they came back and they selected another result and, and went to that site instead. So pogo sticking is quite bad. So linking out in this bow tie model sometimes prevents this. And here's an example of how this works, right? Here's a term budgeting tips. And hopefully if you type this in where you are, you get the same result. But right now, uh, as of I think two days ago, the top result uh, is from a resource center page on Ready for Zero. Uh, and Ready for Zero, this was an old client of mine from a, a number of years ago. And this was one of my recommendations, was to create some of these resource centers. And here's what one looks like. Now, every highlighted reference is to an outgoing link to another site. There's tons of them here, right? Uh, now, they have a, a very robust blog as well, and you can see that there are lots of links to their own blog. But they link out a lot from this page. And if you go to this page, you can see the numbers five and six here. There are, you know, four other sections which have this amount of links on it. So if I click through on that budgeting tips link, and it's the first link on the page, and I get to this page, I'm probably going to click through on some of these links. But after I read that, where am I going to go? I'm not going to go back to the search result. I'm probably going to go back to this page, and I'm going to look here, and I'm going to select another one, right? Because you then, this, this page has become the hub. And this is really the old about.com model. I'm sure everybody is familiar with uh, about.com content. And it's essentially, you know, a very simple page on a topic. And they link to all the different resources for that topic with a little bit of curation and that type of thing. And they're very good at that. And the reason is, is that they basically said, well, we're going to do the curation. We're going to make it easy for people looking at this topic. 
and they win because of that, because instead of going back to the search result, they're using that as the hub. Now there's another secret to this, right? And that is, if you create this type of content, uh, you need to email those people and say, hey, you're featured on this resource center. You're featured on our Palo Alto uh, Senior Care Guide. Um, and here's the thing, that's built-in reciprocity, right? If you email someone and say, hey, we really like you, and so we featured you on this page, well, boy, flattery gets you everywhere because that person, that site, odds are, not right away, but odds are within a certain amount of time, they're going to refer to you. Maybe they're going to tweet something on social media or share it on Facebook. Maybe they're going to create a blog post and they're going to link to you. Maybe they're just going to simply say, hey, I'm going to put a resources page or I have a resources page on my blog or site. I'm going to start referencing you because uh, I see value in what you're doing. Now, this isn't you going out and saying, let's trade links. That's not what I'm talking about. This is truly finding great content, giving it to your users, and then just letting the person know and letting nature take its course. Now here's where we need to get a little more detailed about the reason why linking out is becoming even more important. And this is the way that Google, uh, Google in particular, but search engines overall, are moving from looking at strings to things. Basically, instead of just looking at letters and words, they're looking at entities, right? And so a perfect example of this is the term Golden State Warriors, right? Now in the past, Google would sort of look at that and look at the words and would try and figure out, okay, Golden and State and Warriors, what does that mean? How do we decode that? But now Google understands those three words together, that's an entity, that's a basketball team. And it knows a lot of things about that basketball team. It has a knowledge graph. And so it says, hey, they're located in Oakland, and their head coach is Steve Kerr, and they play at Oracle Arena, and they were founded in Philadelphia, and they play in the Pacific Division, and they've won NBA championships four times, most recently this year, right? A lot of things. And this is why uh, you get things like this as well. Right? It knows things about health, too, and it's got Alzheimer's disease and a whole bunch of stuff about it. Now, it's done a, this in a slightly different way, but the same thing, sort of, uh, the underpinnings still are valid here. And so here's what happens when you link from one site to the other. Each site, Google is sort of combing through the site and identifying those entities. What is it about? What entities does this site have in it so that it can understand it and put it in the knowledge graph? And so when you link from one site to the other, you're sort of passing those entities back and forth to them. And Google's looking at it and going, oh, you know, you're, you're caring and you're linking to the ALZ. Okay, I see, right? You're kind of, uh, I get the topic, right? If you are a realtor, uh, you know, you would want to be linking to Zillow and Trulia and, you know, maybe mortgage calculators and other types of things and Google would start to understand the entity relationship of where you are in that sort of topic continuum. So expertise and authority are sort of granted through entity associations. So not doing this really puts you on an island that makes it far more difficult for Google to understand exactly what you are and when they should surface your site in search results. And that gets me to SEO myth number three, and that is optimizing for root terms. Everybody gets big dollar signs in their eyes thinking, ooh, boy, if I could rank for that term, all my problems would be solved. And you know what? It could happen, but you could also win the lottery, which is about what it is, right? It's really tough to win on these terms, near impossible, unless you have and a boatload of money, uh, a boatload of time to do really big marketing, right? Because there are gorillas in these verticals. There's Yelp, and there's a whole host of other people who have deep pockets. With, like, the Yellow Pages is one. Very, very difficult, right? I'm not saying it's impossible, but one of the things that I dislike is when people focus on this instead of the obvious, right? And sometimes... Uh, it is your name, right? So I'm not going to use this industry because I didn't want to really poke anybody here. So I'm going to use some dentists, right? 
if someone's looking for your brand, for your property, for, for who you are, your name, you better capture that customer because they are much further down the purchase intent funnel than someone who's just looking up assisted living, right? Because obviously they know about you. Someone maybe referred them or maybe they've heard about you, so they're they're typing it in and they want they're pretty pretty hot to trot at that point. So here's one. I've heard, okay, maybe my friend tells me, hey, Pooja, she's she's great, right? So I go, okay, Pooja Malati. Yeah. And here it is, right? Well, it says dentist in Danville, but this is in Vallejo, California, and it's a mess. Uh, and guess what? You've seen this kind of stuff, right? You are not going to stick around. If it doesn't hit you right away, you're going to lose that customer. You're going to walk off and, and do something else. So instead, here's James Mattingly, right? So someone says, hey, go to James. He's great. I type in his name, and here he is. Look at this thing on the right. Big smiling face, five-star reviews, got address and phone, the hours are there, uh, number one with the website attached to his Google Plus, uh, his Google My Business page, and he's also made sure that, you know, he's got his Yelp is, is fully sort of optimized as well as some other things here, right? This is going to win you business, and so I would say to any company, if this is not buttoned up, this is where you start. Uh, don't start trying to get, tackle assisted living. Tackle your name first because this is where you have the highest purchase intent. These people want to figure out whether or not they should give you money. That's the key. Make sure you capture these people first because it's going to be a lot easier to get these people than the people further up on the, the purchase, purchase intent. And really what this means is Google My Business is absolutely essential. You have to have it for your company. Uh, any company which has a, a physical location really absolutely needs to have this. And it needs to be linked to your website and it needs to be verified and then you need to optimize it. Now, here's the thing. The Google My Business, it, it's, it's not easy. Right, uh, it's confusing. It can be maddening. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. You think it's working, it's not. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's worth it. So take the time, take the effort, uh, take a walk outside when you get a little frustrated with the craziness and the fact that no one will answer you, and just keep at it until it gets to where you need it to be. Now, there is a slight difference here. There's SEO, and then there's something called local SEO. So here's, if I'm looking for dentists in Walnut Creek, this section here in the middle of the page, that's called a, a local pack, is sort of what we call it in the industry. Uh, but this is local SEO, and it requires a different set of tactics to appear here than the normal SEO. And in particular, it, it relies on citations, reviews, and in particular, potentially long clicks. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, people clicking on these uh, results uh, is a feedback mechanism for ranking these. So now, this is, this is a different area, uh, and if you want to do this, there are, are certainly uh, agencies and, and small shops that, that specialize in this and can really help in this regard. And in particular, they're going to make sure that your name, address, and phone number are pristine across all of the various data sources out there and they're going to help you to get reviews and have them in the right places and do reputation management, all those good things. There's one more thing that you can do here though, uh, and it's a little outside of what I've talked about, but it's something called the Venice Update, which happened a couple of years ago. Uh, and what the Venice Update did was it said, when people are searching for certain topics, if we find that we know that you live in Concord, California, and you look up, um, I don't know, haircuts, right? Well, sites which have an address in Concord who are hair salons should be promoted onto the first page. 
because obviously they are more related to uh, that query, right? And so uh, for major directory sites, for national directory sites, this was an awful day for them, right? Because that's who was on the front page all the time. You still see a lot of national directories on these pages, but you will see probably three to four slots on these pages to local sites. And it is really up to you to figure out how do I make sure that I'm one of those local sites that shows up. Uh, now the local sites are generally lower down on the page. You're talking, you know, anywhere between rank six and ten, but it's still a nice place to be. And if someone's really looking for a local shop, you're going to get some clicks. And so there's an easy way to do this if you're not doing it already, um, and that is making sure that you have the address of your property on the page. Right, preferably the home page, but you know, if you only have one location, put it on every page. Put it in your in your footer and make sure that it's there so that Google really understands, hey, you are local to this area. So when someone's searching in that area, maybe they're gonna surface you instead of uh, one of these national properties. The great way to do this is to also do it in the code, right? And to use something called schema.org. Uh, which is basically semantic data. It's it's way to sort of tell Google in more structured way about the actual uh, address information. In particular, I actually like that the geo uh, coordinates are in here as well because it just gives that much more richness to Google to sort of hang their hat on and say, we get it. You are in this area. You have a website. So when someone searches for assisted living in Walnut Creek, well, by golly, we're going to put Atria Walnut Creek there. In fact, that's exactly how I found this. So, too long, didn't listen. Uh, I always put a TLDL, which sort of wraps up a presentation. Do or not do. When it comes to content, there is no try. Uh, not everyone is cut out to be a Jedi. There are very few of them. Just same thing. Not everyone should do content marketing and do content. Uh, if you're going to do it, you need to do it full steam. So think about it, be careful about it, and if you're going to do it, really embrace it. Number two, don't isolate yourself. Right? Don't, uh, you know, here's, here's someone, I guarantee you, no one here knows who this is. Um, this happens to be J.D. Salinger, uh, author of Catcher in the Rye, who was a notorious recluse. Right? Um, you can't be J.D. Uh, now, granted, wrote a fantastic novel, but at the end of the day, you need to link out. You need to join the community. You need to be a partner. You need to not isolate yourself, not just for search engines, but just to be part of that community to ensure that other people are going to refer to you, to ensure that you are really sending all the right signals to both search engines and users. And finally, Optimize your Google My Business profile and put your address on the page. Just do it, uh, get it done, and then you can move on. But these, this is really sort of the critical thing that you can do to make sure that everything is sort of set from the get-go and that you have those, those basics covered before you try and attack other types of, of uh, queries or other types of content. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. We can pass it back over to Katie and start to take some questions. Awesome, AJ. Thanks. I'm going to shift back here, so bear with me. Okay. Um, carrying the old sensor. Screen. Okay. All right. Discussion and questions. Um, thank you, AJ. That was a lot of information. Um, we will be sending out the deck with the links to the various resources that AJ referenced. Um, so don't worry if you didn't get everything written down. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask Megan if we've got some questions. Um, Katie and AJ, we do. One question that's come up is, I'm curious about the frequency of new content or posts that need to remain relevant. Is this tr to true fans? How, how often does this need to happen? 
Sure. Uh, so this is actually a, a great myth. I could have put this as uh, one of the myths. Fresh content, right? Everybody says you need fresh content. And uh, when, when Google talks about fresh content, they're talking about new content. So they like kittens, right? Brand new kittens. They can't get, a, oh, something new on the Internet. I want to look at it, right? It's so cute and it's new. Uh, what they don't want is you to have a, a great article that you wrote, you know, a year ago and is doing fine, and you say, well, boy, maybe if I, I put the date on it and I made it, you know, today, or maybe if I, you know, just changed a couple of words and republished, that's not new content. That's not fresh content, um, and that won't work. Um, Google understands that, and they're not going to reward that. Now, if you have a blog uh, uh, or you're doing any type of content marketing, uh, you do need to have consistent content coming out. Uh, that, that's my general recommendation uh, because that's the only way that you're going to build a community. That's the only way you're going to build uh, those fans. Um, and it's the only way that you're really going to make an impact and, and start to get that sort of uh, form habits in the people that you are communicating with. So. I wouldn't say that there is a, a fresh content from a search engine perspective. It's much more of a user perspective, and, and if you're going to embrace content, you need to make sure that you have enough of it coming out. Uh, you can't go to the blog and have a user say, well, boy, this, this person hasn't put anything out in eight months, so I'm out of here, right? It's, it's more of the sniff test from a user, uh, not from a search engine. Another question. Um, should freelance writers do they need Google My Business, and should freelance writers put their addresses on the page? Hmm. Freelance writers, uh, probably not Google My Business, no. Uh, I mean, it's not a physical location. I guess if you want to have, like, uh, if you want to work out of your home, you can put your home as your business and do that, but... Uh, I don't think that's going to probably help you all that much in the scheme of things. Uh, I think uh, the freelance business world is, is uh, our writing world is more, uh, and I know, you know, uh, a couple of good ones, it's, it's a lot about networking and, uh, and uh, making sure that you have those bylines in place and that it points back to a site which you maintain. I would say having a site which showcases uh, what you do and, and having that is far more important, but I, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't invest uh, heavily in, uh, in Google My Business uh, or worry too much about your uh, nap if I were in the uh, freelance writing business. AJ, this is Katie. Building on that, what if you are a home care agency and, for example, had a physical office in Danville but serve the entire East Bay? Would you want to focus on optimizing for Danville or not? Uh, I think you, you would have to figure out um, where you wanted to focus uh, is really what it would come down to. Um, you could try to create pages that that uh, addressed each of those uh, areas, but I think that would be tough. For Google My Business, you'd have to pick one, right? You would basically uh, have to, uh, you know, basically say, hey, this is our location, right? Because it is, it's, it's going to look for those, those locations. If you are a franchisee, uh, they do allow you to have multiple locations, and you can upload a bulk upload, and you can have uh, one uh, page for each uh, location. But uh, when it comes to sort of service areas, it's one of the frustrating things right now. But yes, you'd have to basically optimize for that specific location. And then once that got to your page, you could say, you know, these are the areas that we serve. Um, another question that's come up. Is it important to have the address at the top of the page or as long as it's on the home page? Uh, as long as it's on the home page, uh, I think the question would be, do, do your users want it at the top of the page, right? Does it help the user to see the address at the top of the page? 
If you think it does, then leave it at the top of the page. If, if not, um, then putting it at the bottom is fine. Uh, for Google, it just needs to see the address, and it needs to see it uh, that it's correct uh, and it matches sort of what it thinks your address should be, right? So in this space, uh, NAP is what most people talk about, name, address, phone number. And if your NAP is uh, not consistent across all these profiles and, and sites and, and data repositories, bad things happen because Google sort of goes, I don't, I don't get it. Who are you? Uh, I don't trust that I've got the right person or the right site, uh, and it, it will sort of give up in frustration at that point. So it uh, doesn't quite matter to Google where it is on the page, uh, but if you think that having the address, or particularly the phone number, I've seen a lot of instances where having the phone number at the top is, is quite powerful, uh, then keep it up there. As someone, this is Katie, as someone who spends a lot of her day looking at websites for assisted living companies, I would beg you all to seriously consider putting your address at the top of the page. I think it's hugely, hugely helpful to anyone who's actually looking for a community. It would make sense uh, to me that location is obviously a pretty big determining factor in this. So being able to see that address, uh, you know, maybe even having the ability to have a little thing where you hit it and it says show on map and you can see it on the map. All those things I think are great visual cues and give people, uh, you know, that sense of ease right, of, uh, right away, right? And again, this is something that I was sort of touching about uh, at the beginning about what SEO is, right? When I land on that page, what do I want to know? Uh, and if you can give that to me quickly, then you're putting me at ease. I feel a greater sense of trust. You're not making me work for, you know, all these types of things. I think one of the best examples I can give uh, is actually what you do when you see on Google. So if you type in, you know, your favorite restaurant, let's say, and you'll see a knowledge panel come up for that restaurant, and it will have reviews for that restaurant, it'll have directions for that restaurant, it'll have where it is on the map, it will have whether it's open today or not, it will have, hey, do you want to make a reservation? It will have uh, other places you might go if this place is booked, all that sort of stuff, right? And so at a glance, uh, when you look, you get all the information you could ever want and it becomes very easy for you to make that decision. Um, and so it's something which uh, I'm passionate about, which is called cognitive fluency, a uh, fancy term for saying that, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to be familiar and understand your page and, and what they're looking at, um, because if there's any disfluency going on, it really hinders decision making. Uh, they're far less likely to make that decision uh, at all, or it might be m far more difficult for them to make a decision. So to Katie's point, uh, you know, I think location is probably pretty big, so, um, you know, putting it at the top might not be the worst thing in the world. Another question that's come up is, with the information that was shared today, how does it improve our domain authority, and how important is domain authority? So, uh, Domain authority, uh, so for those who don't really understand what domain authority is, it's essentially, um, you know, how important your domain is based uh, primarily upon how many sites and what type of sites are linking to you. And the short answer is domain authority is still important, uh, and it absolutely can help uh, you rank uh, better. I think um, what I would say is that it is getting those links is not the goal, it's the result of the activities that you're going to do, right? So I, I think the, the largest issue I have with most people when they approach this subject is they say, I need more links. And so how do I get more links? Um, and links are the results, they are not the goal, right? Of course you want the links, but uh, you sort of have to do this Jedi mind trick to say, no, I'm, uh, I'm going to build a resource which people in my community are going to love and so they're going to link to me. Or I'm going to create some content which will be referenced by other people because it's great. Or uh, I will 
and we'll do any of these things which will result in this thing happening. So I think uh, it's absolutely still hugely valuable. I will say it's really important to have topical links, right? So if you are uh, a site uh, about in-home care or assisted living uh, in a geography, getting links from other places in that geography are good. Uh, getting links from other sites which are about your topic are good. But let's say getting links from the Monster Truck Rally site uh, is not good. Uh, I mean, maybe it won't hurt, uh, but it certainly won't help most likely um, because, you know, Google's really gotten much better at figuring out and saying, are these topical links, is this a real citation? Uh, and so uh, using content is a great way to earn those links, and I think that's really how I talk to most clients these days. It's not link building, it's link earning. And if you're embracing link earning, good things happen, not right away, but eventually. Uh, but if, uh, if you go down the link building path, you open yourself up to uh, future sort of Google algorithm uh, updates and, and as Google sweeps through and says, yeah, we see what you did there and, and we think it's manufactured. It's not real authority. So uh, long story short, super important still, but how you get there is just as important. Okay, Katie. Um, we have a content question. Does it matter where the content shows up on the home page, or is the idea of still having things other than pictures being above the fold important? Uh, so does it matter? Uh, so uh, this is a little bit about um, readability, I guess, is at the end of the day. Uh, I, to me, I'm not a huge fan of the huge picture at the top of the page and have the text underneath. Uh, I just, it, it seems like a design fad uh, and I don't think it, it does a tremendous amount for the user. I don't think it hurts SEO at that point, but um, I certainly, I don't think it really helps the user either. But readability is a huge portion of this, uh, and I don't, I didn't talk about that here. But when you're producing content, uh, making it readable, easy to read, easy to scan, right? And so that's actually the the bigger issue. When I talk about easy to read, I really mean easy to scan. There have been countless studies done that show that people don't really read on the web that often. Uh, they're skimming. They're scanning. Uh, and the most recent research said that, on average, people only read 21% of the words on any given web page. 21%. Um, so making it easy to read, whether or not that is using the right font size, using the right, um, uh, you know, width between the, the lines so that everything looks good and is easy to read, using a legible font, uh, breaking up your paragraphs um, so that they're not monster chunks of text, you know, two to three sentences per paragraph perhaps, and that even that might be too long, uh, and having good subheads, large subheads which allow people to sort of go from section to section and understand, okay, there's this, there's that. And that's where the pictures come in as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of using pictures throughout a piece of content to sort of break up the flow, maybe give someone something to look at or something to remember that they, oh, I get it, I'm making the connection. All of those things uh, can matter quite a bit um, from a readability standpoint. And uh, that's going to be more meaningful because if it's readable, people are actually going to get to the end. They're going to potentially want to share it. When they share it, then it gets in front of more people and then somebody might actually link to it, right? Um, all too often I see people do content and they might have great content, but if it's all nine point, you know, font and it's a wall of text, it could be the most well-written piece of content, but if I can't really read it or if it is just tough for me to get through, uh, it, you're not going to get far. 
So yes, it, it means a lot from a user perspective, and then from there, all those signals matter to the search engine. From a strict, um, you know, uh, natural language perspective, Google looking at the words on the page, it doesn't matter. But uh, from a user satisfaction and all the signals that that throws off, which is increasingly more of what Google is looking at, it will matter, right? So let's think about the pogo sticking example, right? If you have a piece of content which is just an eyesore to look at, the odds that someone hits that and goes, oh God, I'm not going to read that, and they bounce right back out and they go to something else, it's basically going to deep six your content. So when they land on that piece of content, it needs to, for me, immediately communicate that they found the right place and that it's easy for them to, to get into it. So I'll, I'll say, I'll, this is Katie, I, we've been doing a data cleanup project here at caring.com, so in the last two weeks I think I've personally looked at probably a hundred websites for, um, in this case, specifically assisted living communities. and. My feeling is that when I'm doing internet research and looking at a community web page, I don't really want to see the same stock photo of an, a happy old person. There's like, I don't know, 50 of them on the web and everybody uses all the same ones. And so that to me is not helpful and it's also not helpful to me to know that this is a caring place that wants to honor my parents in their golden years, I'm just going to assume that you do that. The thing that I most immediately want to know when I visit your website is where are you and what sort of services do you offer? So, um, ha you know, please have your address on the front page um, and then let me know this community offers ILAL and memory care. Um, and then, you know, maybe I'll dive down and read more about your philosophy and, and that sort of thing. But if I can't find that quickly, I'm, I'm really just not going to look much. Um, the other thing that, that is hugely important to me is, is reviews. I want to know what ordinary people think of your site. So um, if, you're, if you don't have a focus on reputation management and getting those consumer reviews and monitoring them, um, you know, please do that. That's, that's about as important um, a P, uh, an element in a marketing program as you can get. Um, yeah. right. I would also say, you know, and it, it doesn't even have to be reviews. The reviews are fantastic. But you can also just do testimonials, right? It doesn't have to be, oh, we took this from Yelp. You know, interview somebody, talk to somebody, get a real person and say, hey, we'd like to feature you. Uh, that alone, uh, again, satisfies sort of Katie's need to say, hey, I want to see that, that real people uh, like you. And, and so if it's a testimonial that is there uh, that sort of reads like a review, that's going to work as well. And the other thing I'd say, you know, AJ's talked a lot about how much effort it takes to do a good job of ranking for a bunch of these terms. And I will tell you here at caring.com, we spend a tremendous amount of time and energy and resources getting ranked for terms. It, it is a huge project. And if your company is not ready to take that on in a big way, um, you can work with somebody like us or the other referral sites out on the web. and you know, kind of borrow, part of the, uh, the value that you get from working with us is all of the energy that we're putting into to ranking. So, you know, if you want to do it yourself um, and invest all that time and money, that's great. If you don't want to spend that much time and money, there are other ways to get there, um, you know, borrowing Google, borrowing caring.com, borrowing other sites that will, will help you get to the top. And AJ, I know you and I talked about this, but you think that to, to really do a good job of, of SEO and, and ranking is like, what, five to $10,000 a month? Yeah, yeah, five to $10,000 a month. And I know that there are some, you know, sites will come to you and say, hey, for $500 a month, we can do X, Y, and Z. Uh, you might as well flush that money down the drain. Um, if, you, if you're serious about it, it's going to be five to 10K a month. 
Um, and what Katie's talking about is actually a great tactic, uh, and it has a name in the industry too. It's called barnacle SEO, uh, and it, it's sort of uh, those barnacles on the boat. You know, you're sort of attaching yourself to the big boat, uh, and you attach yourself to as many big boats as possible. Uh, so it might be Yelp. Uh, in the one that I presented, there was also Diamond Certified, right? So Diamond Certified ranks well, get in Diamond Certified, and suddenly you've got another one. So that uh, you're always sort of attaching yourself to these uh, other sites who do have uh, the money and the horsepower to do this stuff, and, and you're just riding, riding on their coattails. All right. Um, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I would encourage you to mark your calendars for our next webinar, which is going to be all about pricing, um, both how to optimize your price, minimize discounts, and also what do you do with that pricing once you have it? How do you best communicate that to families? Um, so if you have strong feelings about things like whether you should post your price online on your website, which uh, I have very strong feelings about, um, but we're hopefully going to have a great discussion on that in August um, with a couple of terrific guest presenters. So um, thank you all for joining us and uh, stick with us for the next round of the Caring Digital Marketing Academy. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me.